be available on YouTube later. And with all of that, I think that is all the behind the scenes housekeeping I have. I finished that in uh, about five minutes, so a little longer than I meant to. Um, thank you, Bill, for giving me some time to get through all that. I do appreciate it. I am now gonna turn the floor over to you for, for the star of the show, what we all came here for. Tell us a bit about MUTCD, what's going on and what we might wanna be aware of. All right, well, thanks, Marilee. Um, looking to share the screen for my presentation. So I'm just gonna make the, um, well, let's go to the start, the front page. So you guys looking at the uh, PowerPoint presentation? We are, that is up perfectly. So that's, that's good. Um, happy to be with this group. I haven't spoken to the T-squared audience in a while, um, probably because of, uh, as a result, to some degree of the time that it's been since we've had a, a new edition of the MUTCD. Um, it had been something that I was doing fairly regularly. Um, and it seemed like around 2014, 15, 16, we were always talking about the next edition of the end of the uh, MUTCD and um, not necessarily having um, training on something that was going to be outdated. Well, it's been five years or so since that time, a uh, long time coming. The federal rulemaking process is pretty cumbersome, uh, especially when they roll um, something as, I guess, as straightforward as MUTCD into all the other rulemaking that goes on. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been the state traffic engineer for New Hampshire DOT since uh, 2000. Um, at this point, if uh, my counterpart in Iowa sticks around, uh, he's the only other state traffic engineer that's been in the position longer than me. Um, but I think he's had some breaks in service for uh, military service. So I may have more years than him as state traffic engineer. Um, as state traffic engineer, I'm also involved with the American Association of State Highway Tra Transportation Officials or AASHTO. Um, I am leading the MUTCD subcommittee for, for AASHTO at this point in time uh, through the Committee on Traffic Engineering. So I've been involved with the review of the MUTCD on that side. I'm also a member, I'm currently the um, vice chair of programs, which is the, the number two person in the National Committee of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And I'll talk more about them in a minute. So I've been involved with uh, reviewing the NPA from state agency perspective, the AASHTO perspective, national committee perspective, um, and I'm probably planning on, on doing a individual comment to the docket as well. So it's been three or four parallel efforts to review the MUTCD. And I, I hear people sometimes say that there should be more frequent updates to the MUTCD, but given um, the hours that I've spent on it in the last three months, if anybody suggests that to Federal Highway, I will probably hunt them down because it, it's a very involved process trying to respond to rulemaking. And, and that's for somebody that deals with it from the state level. And what I'm hoping to do today is um, give you a brief history of, of the MUTCD. And uh, some of you that might have had the, the training that I've done for T squared in the past, that'll be a repeat. And I apologize for it. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But I think it's, it's um, appropriate to have some understanding of the background of the MUTCD when we're talking about the rulemaking process. Uh, I'll give you a really short overview of what the National Committee uh, role is in the process. Um, and then talk about the federal rulemaking process. I'm hoping to get to the website so I can show you uh, where the rulemaking is posted, how to maneuver your way around it, and then how to submit comments to the docket. And lastly, have a discussion of what uh, in the last three months have been identified as significant changes in the proposed MUTCD. And then there's some significant changes that I think are significant to probably states or large cities. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on what I consider to be significant changes uh, from a local perspective. So if there's no questions, I guess we'll just get started. Perfect. Uh, and I, I just in the, the interest of full disclosure, I'm working from a 13 inch laptop from home um, so I had a week and a half ago, I had my first uh, Pfizer COVID shot and after 12 months of not even having a day of sick, I came, I got the sniffles over the weekend, I'm not saying it's related, um, but the way, um, the protocols have been in the workforce, uh, the workplace, you have sniffles or any kind of symptoms and you're encouraged to stay away, which is appropriate. Um, so I, I don't have the access to my multiple monitors and, and things like that. So. If I have a scratchy voice, um, I apologize for that. And if um, you're finding me maneuvering around the, the software, um, you'll understand why. And one of the things I find with working with Zoom on one screen is I've got this gallery on my right side of my screen that's got your faces on it. 
And sometimes it covers stuff in the slide. So if you see me kind of lean to one side, I'm trying to look behind the gallery. Um, I'm not necessarily IT fluent, or um, but I, I didn't, never considered myself to be IT challenged until the last three months and finding a lot about what my skill set is. Um, Bill, so if it's helpful and you prefer not to see our faces, you could probably go up to view and you might be able to change that view. Depends on if you want to be able to see responses or there's only or there's only four and I can see most of my screen. So it, it shouldn't be much of an issue. And it, it's good to have um because that at least show me if if somebody unmutes and has something to say. And I, I'd like to be able to see the face of people that are asking me questions. So super. But thank you for that. So let's get right into the history of the MUTCD. And, and I definitely have to give credit to uh, Dr. Gene Hawkins, Texas A&M. Uh, he is a second generation traffic engineer and, and he has collected all of the MUTCDs over the years. And is, uh, I've stolen from some of his slides, uh, slideshows to come up with the material that I have. Um, so this is the current MU, MUTCD, the 2009 edition. Uh, it's evolved over the years, starting with uh, the process that began in the mid, I guess the Midwest in 1922. Um, 1924 was the National Conference on Street and Highway Safety that was convened by then Secretary of uh, the Interior, I think, Herbert Hoover. Um, 25, the American Association of State Highway Officials um, submitted a joint board report. All of that led to the first MUTCD in 1935. Um, which essentially was trying to provide for uniform application. And all of that effort leading to the first MUTCD was a recognition is that as Americans were becoming more mobile, especially with the auto, automobile uh, and driving into jurisdictions that they might not be familiar with, that it was important that the traffic control devices that guided them and regulated them, warned them uh, were consistent so that they knew how to respond. And at the time in 35, the markings were only used at hazardous locations. And that was when they established the three color signal as a standard. Uh, the next edition was in 42, which addressed some wartime conditions. Uh, not a lot, lot of changes there. Um, I'll scan through some of the additions and what was considered um, significant. Uh, 48 was the first time that you saw um, signal warrants. So um, some kind of an analysis of where signals would, were appropriate. Uh, that first appeared in the 48 edition. 54 was a minor revision to that previous edition. It included red stop sign versus yellow, uh, and it introduced the yield sign. And in 58, obviously with the um, interstate highway system, uh, there was an interstate highway manual um, that was revised in 61, 62, and 70 as the interstate highways were being built. Uh, 61, MUTCD was a, a full revision of the 48. Uh, that's where federal compliance was required. Um, up until that time, it was more guidance, uh, which is kind of the Canadian model now. Um, and then it added construction traffic control and civil defense signing. Uh, civil defense being a big issue in the early 60s, uh, but with all the construction that was going on with the interstates and just reconstructing highways that were built decades earlier, uh, the temporary traffic control was recognized as important. Then 71 was a complete MUTC, so 10 years later was another comp complete MUTCD over, uh, rewrite. Uh, and that was the first one that Federal Highway was the owner, had the ownership of the publication. Uh, prior to that, it was more of a collective um, publication, but Federal Highway became the owner publisher in 1971. It added a, a section on school areas and it added many new symbols resulting from international sign influence. So the symbols that we're pretty familiar with now uh, that you see on the slide, we decided to get introduced into the manual and uniform traffic control devices in 71. 78, so in just seven years was an update of the 71 manual. It included railroad, railroad highway crossings, bicycle facilities were added, and then it also changed um, the markings or added yellow markings for um, the left side, something we kind of take for granted now, uh, but center line markings and then the left side of the highway uh, were yellow as of 1978. 88 was the first, not to date myself, but the 88 edition is the one that I first used and was familiar with. It was an update to the 78 manual and then had between this 88 manual and the next edition in 2000, there were seven of revisions that were published by Federal Highway. It added the recreational cultural signs and it added the logo signs that you see on the screen, uh, the specific service signs uh, that you probably started seeing popping up more in New Hampshire in the last couple of years. 
So 2000 was a complete rewrite of the 88 manual and it changed the format um, of the way that the manual was presented. And it also became the first living document. So this was the first edition that was published online. Um, so published copies of the 2000 manual, printed copies of the 2000 manual were essentially um, not the official version. The official version was what was online. And that continues to be the case moving forward. Although there's still a number of us that like to have a piece of uh, a paper that they, we can handle. Um, the 2000 manual was, was reissued in 2003, essentially to correct, because there was, in, even though it was 12 years since the previous edition, there were so many errors in the first publication of the millennial edition that they released a new edition in 2003 to correct those errors. Uh, and it changed the font size, margins, and spacing to essentially um, better use the space in the manual. And then the two, 2009 revision, was uh, the one that we're using now. It was a revision of the 2003. It added material for tolls and managed lanes. That was first introduced in that sign because of the, the I guess the uh, unique aspects of those facilities. It added community wayfinding signs, um, which would be kind of local directional signs that some of you, the state, the towns that might be on this uh, presentation would have uh, in their local. And I think Federal Highway was trying to provide some consistency in how those were being displayed. A lot of the community wayfinding signs are developed by landscape architects or people that are planners and not by traffic engineers. Um, so that was a lot of variety in how they would be in, I guess, created and used. Uh, and then there were several new standards. One new standard that was initially introduced in 2009 was um, that a standard shall be followed in all cases at all times, essentially, which is, pretty much understood, um, but there's so many standards in the manual uh, that that got to be problematic for a lot of the, the state agencies and, and I guess practitioners, because it, it made it clear that there was no allowable variation from a standard in any case. So Federal Highway got a lot of pressure on that and they a lot of pushback and they issued a ruling that standard could be modified uh, based on engineering study. Um, so it, it wasn't exactly what the practitioners wanted, but it, it at least gave some flexibility. One of the other things that was big at the time in the 2000s, it got a lot of attention, but it wasn't as big as it, as it seemed to be, was a compliance state on increasing the, size, the sizes of street name size. Um, so that got a lot of attention because it, some cities, it was going to be millions of dollars to change all the street signs, um, but there wasn't any requirement to do it by a specific date. That, that was the way the news was reporting it. Um, and then uh, that's the history of the NUTCD. Now we're, we're at the point that we are now where 12 years later, we're looking at a new edition. Uh, before I move on to the National Committee, are there any questions on kind of background of the NUTCD or um, what it means, how, how it applies to law or anything like that? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat pod just yet. So we should be good. All right. So the National Committee, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, um, but the National Committee of Uniform Traffic Control Devices um, is a collective, I guess, a volunteer effort uh, made up of several of 21 sponsoring organizations. Um, we meet a couple times a year, um, and, and it was founded in 1979, but it was preceded by variations of the National Committee right into the early 1920s. Um, but dating back as far as 1924, um, essentially in the, I guess, the late 60s, early 70s, they were a joint advisory committee uh, to the Federal Highway Administration for providing advice for content in the MUTCD. In the, in the Carter administration in the 70s, they eliminated all of the joint advisory committees throughout federal government so that the, uh, the, that what, was, what preceded the National Committee no longer existed as a formal advisory committee to Federal Highway. So members of that group collectively found, uh, founded the National Committee of Uniform Traffic Control Devices as an informal advisory panel. Um, so they're made up of sponsoring organizations that included AASHTO. AASHTO's got eight of the 41 um, voting delegates, as does the Institute of Transportation Engineers. American Public Works Association, the National Association of County Engineers, I think county or city, and NACTO is the National Association of County Transportation Officials are all sponsoring organizations, along with Triple E, 
the League of American Bicyclists, um, not, not Triple E, Triple A, uh, League of American Bicyclists. Um, I don't believe the Insurance Institute of, of uh, Highway Safety is involved. Um, the human factors groups. So there's 21 sponsoring organizations uh, representing a very wide range of traffic operations and traffic safety uh, perspectives. Um, and they meet twice a year, like I said, uh, the usual attendance is over 300 folks uh, that when we met in person was over 300 uh, virtually. I think we're well over that because people don't have to pay to travel. Um, so most of the work is done with the, within eight technical committees that parallel essentially the, the MUTCD parts. So there's technical committees on uh, the edit committee that I chair uh, is the part one technical committee. And then you've got the science chapter broke it, broken into two separate technical committees, one for regulatory warning signs uh, and one for guide signs and motorist information. Then you've got markings, technical committee, signals. Um, there's a CAV task force that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there's also um, a, te a technical committee on rail and light rail and one on bicycles. And then there's, although there's a part in the MUTCD on schools, uh, the material in that part um, is reviewed or considered by the people in the respective uh, technical committees for markings, regulatory warning signs, and guide signs, and signals where appropriate. So the, the, the technical committees will meet prior to the full council meeting, and, and they will wordsmith every word and sentence within the MUTCD and try to come up with recommendations for improving the language or adding to it. And uh, right now, those technical committees are reviewing in detail uh, the proposed rulemaking uh, and they're getting right into the weeds because that's what the national committee does and and the the beauty of the national committee is the different perspectives that are represented there are kind of a uh, mirror the different perspectives that you'll see in in the public um, so they've got people that are on uh, one side all the way to the um, i guess vehicle centric side uh, but they've also got folks that are representing pedestrians and bicyclists and the um, um, the disabled community as well. So it's, there's a very wide perspective. So when the national committee gets together and comes up with language that they recommend to federal highway, it's been vetted through a pretty intense process of, of uh, compromise and, and co uh, cooperation. And once the technical committees come up with the recommended language, it doesn't end there because they have to present it to the council. The council is made up of representatives of all the sponsoring organizations and depending on the size of the sponsoring organization and their role, uh, determines how many votes. Uh, ASHTO, for instance, has eight delegates to the council, as does ITE. NACTO has three, and I think um, the APWA also has three. So there's 41 voting members of council, and the council will, will further wordsmith the recommendations that the technical committees come up with uh, to develop language that then goes to Federal Highway. Now, Federal Highway is not obligated to incorporate the language of the, of the National Committee, um, but practice has been that if, if they don't um, at least consider it, then when they send the rulemaking process out like they do right now, um, the, they're going to get those similar comments from the public because a lot of the national committee folks will also submit separate comments to the docket. Um, they represent those perspectives. So it's, it's incumbent upon Federal Highway to take pretty serious consideration, although they're not required to, of material submitted by the the National Committee. Um, I've been involved with the National Committee for uh, 20 years now since I became state traffic engineer. In that time, I've been involved with the Markings Technical Committee and I've chaired the Guided Motors Information and the Regulatory Warnings Technical Committees. And now that I'm the, um, the Vice Chair of Programs, I have the Chair of the Edit Committee. And the Edit Committee is part one, but it's also is responsible for format of um, the rest of the manual. Anybody have any questions on, on the National Committee or any of that process? Okay, I appreciate that. Um, it's, it's a very interesting process. Um, it could be pretty overwhelming for somebody that's fairly new to the effort, um, but there's a lot of, I've learned a lot from the folks in the National Committee. Um, there's a lot of people that have spent a lot of time reading word for word what's in the manual and they, they take that material seriously and they, and they are very diligent in trying to make it the best product that it can be. 
And I can tell you that a lot of the material that's in the proposed NPA is specifically something that was recommended by the National Committee. Um, there's things in the NPA like hard shoulder running that the, the National Committee hasn't quite gotten to yet. The Federal Highway had to come up with something and probably a lot of the CAV material is something that Federal Highway had to come up with separately. But a lot of the material that you see in the NPA um, is parallels what was submitted previously by the National Committee. So federal highway rulemaking, uh, I'm gonna try to get to the website and I think I'm gonna have to stop sharing this presentation and go to the website when I do it, but just to give an overview, um, the link that I, I've got on the screen now, essentially if you uh, Google MUTCD and, and, um, and go to the, I guess the first result, it'll bring you to the MUTCD federal highway webpage mutcd.fhwa.dot.gov, which we'll go through in a second. Uh, and then you, when you open that screen, it usually gives you a pretty um, current um, summary of what's going on in the MUTC process. So if you scroll down to a, a, a link to the notice of proposed amendments of the 11th edition of the MUTCD, you'll have a couple more links. One would be the Federal Register. The Federal Register is going to give you a lot of the background of what's being proposed. Um, so the Federal Register includes uh, a lot of the background of the process, but it also includes descriptions of uh, the 647 unique changes that are being proposed in the, uh, the amendments that are being proposed in the federal rulemaking process. Um, some of those changes represent several different sections of the MUTCD, but they're the 647 specific changes being proposed. And then you could also link on that notice of proposed amendments webpage to the public docket but gives you links to comments and other relevant material. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is go to that website now. And I will stop sharing this presentation and start sharing the website. Hey, Tina did pop that link into the chat pod also for those who might want the link as well. And we are seeing your browser just fine. All right, so this is the MBTCD's front page. And it, if you're looking for information about the MUTCD, there's a lot of good information here. Um, if you're looking on the left, um, there's the overview of the MUTCD evolution, uh, who uses the MUTCD, um, and then discussion about exper experimentations. And then there's a link to the standard highway signs and markings book, which for those of you that are manufacturing your own signs, that gives you all the, the details and specifications as to what that should look like. Uh, there's also a discussion of uh, the MUTCD team, um, the individuals that are responsible for the MUTCD, uh, the reference that incorporates the MUTCD into federal law. Uh, there's links to official rulings, interim approvals, uh, interpretations, uh, and then links to state MUTs and things like that. And there's also the uh, publications, trainings, and other events. So there's a lot of good material just on the left side of the screen. And I know I'm pointing and you guys can't see my hands, but the left side of the screen is um, all the, the options you see on the left. In the middle of the page, and what I'm gonna focus on for this presentation is the notice of proposed amendments. Um, so you can see that posting that talks about the next edition of the MUTCD. And there's a link to the notice of proposed amendments. And I'm hoping as I go through that, you guys follow that link too, right, Merrily? If you click on a link, if it opens up in PDF, um, we probably won't see it if you share just your screen. But it goes, do you see the, the one now that's got the list of, uh, of dates related to the notice of proposed amendments? No, we're seeing the, um, the date, the list of dates for. So right here, this says December, December 14th. 14th. Yep. All right, so, so you see the same screen that I have. So, Perfect. So December 14th is when the Federal Highway dropped the notice of proposed amendments uh, to, the, uh, to the MUTCD. Um, and that was right before Christmas, so there's a lot of things going on. But it only took them till December 17th to have somebody point out that they, uh, they had some, or they needed to make some corrections to it. So there's a corrected um, correction to the sporting do documents of the MUTCD was issued then. And I think the other thing that would be uh, of note uh, is February 2nd. Um, initially, the docket period was three months. It was going to expire uh, in March. Um, Federal Highway got a lot of requests to extend it for either 60 or 90 days. And in February 2nd, they agreed to extend it to 
um, May 14th. So they added another, another um, 60 days to the public comment period. Um, so this is the one that's kind of the current. So it's got the two links, one to the federal register and one to the public docket. I'll go to the federal register first. And I just want to confirm that you see something that, that's got a, a page that's headed Federal Register, right? Yes, we see the Federal Register page. You got it. All right. So Federal Register is going to, if you scroll down the Federal Register, it goes through a lot of boilerplate stuff about the process, dates, addresses, further information, supplementary information, information, and then background. All good reading material if you've got some time to kill and you're looking to uh, aid your... Um, Aid in sleeping, uh, but not something necessarily that many people would be interested in. And I think that that might have been the wrong, the wrong link because that usually has a summary of all the comments. So I'm going to go down to this December 14th um, Federal Register. Uh, so I think that's the one I'm looking for. We are seeing that that screen now. Okay, that's got all that same material. Um, summary of the major provisions of the regulatory action. And then if you keep scrolling down background, the uh, what would be the most interest with this when you get to the number docket items. So discussion of proposed amendments to part one in general, and it's, it starts numbering them and it's gonna be one through 647. And, and like I said, some of these include multiple changes uh, the one that includes the most changes, and I don't have it memorized, I think it's 616. Uh, it might be something different than that, but it's the, uh, it's the typical applications in part six, the temporary traffic control. Uh, so each one of those is included as one item. I mean, collectively, all of those are included as one item, and there's several new ones in there. So 647 might be a little bit misleading. Um, but this is how you would get to, I guess, the description of what the proposed change is. And this is where Federal Highway will tell you, uh, for instance, in part one, um, the existing MUTCD has an introduction and a part one. And then the reorganization that Federal Highway is proposing is they combine those two. So this, this description is going to tell you why they combined it. And one of the format changes is that they're, they're going to list all the traffic control devices in all caps as opposed to upper lower case. Uh, so they describe those things. One that's, uh, I, and I won't scroll through 647 because you guys would, wouldn't even stay long, long enough to get that. But one of the things that's generated some conversation in this particular um, NPA is uh, item number five, which is Federal Highway proposing to add a new section, um, one AO3 tar titled target road user. And I think their impression with, with this is to, or their, I guess their intent is to provide some protection for practitioners from, um, from somebody that's not attentive, distracted, um, going off the road and getting hurt, and then claiming that it was because they didn't have adequate traffic control. Um, my experience as a defendant in a lot of cases is that kind of language is not going to prevent me from being sued and, or necessarily prevent me from, um, or the, the person that's taking me to court for being successful. Uh, so it didn't really add a lot of value and, and the target road user that they talk about as a driver or an operator of a vehicle was alert, attentive, and uh, reasonable and prudent and, and um, complying with the rules of the road, traffic laws and ordinances or something to that effect. And the pedestrians were also alert and attentive. And if you look at the material in the MUTCD, it's almost all of it is for people that are not alert and attentive. I mean, you, if you, if your target road user was alert and attentive and following the rules of the road, you wouldn't need warning signs because they would see those conditions. So that, that's the kind of thing you get out of the federal register is that description of why they're making the changes. So if, if you look through the marked up versions of the material and you have questions, you come back to this to see what federal highway's reasoning was for, for making the changes. So now with that, I'm going to go back to um, December 14th and go to the public docket section of the, of the uh, process. So you click on that public docket link and it brings you to regulations.gov. And I'm thinking you, you guys are seeing that now. 
Is that web page? Okay. We are. Yep. So if you if you get to this front page um, for this docket item, browse comments and docket comments on documents. Um, you'll have pages that'll bring you to um, the proposed rule. This is the proposed rule that was posted on December 14th. Um, the next one is the proposed rule that was revised. Uh, then you get supporting um, and related material. And then you get a comment form. So if you go to the supporting and related material, no, that's not the right one. I can tell you that they don't make the process simple um, from what I've seen. But if you go to the, let's go to the revised docket item so that we get the right one. So it's gonna give you kind of the same summary that was in the previous document, but along with that, they will, um, they'll give you the opportunity to download the files. And this is where I can't see the screen. So if you download the PDF, this might not be, this might be something where I have to sh stop sharing the screen again. Yeah, you'd probably have to share the PDF, yep. I apologize, I could follow along and probably share it also. Hold on one moment. So but you can see the regulations.gov and then the yeah. open file. I think when you open the file, we'll see if it's, oh, no, it opened in your browser. So we are seeing it. Okay, good. So that's, and that's um, essentially the federal docket again. All right. So I just minimized the, uh, the gallery. So I can't see you folks now. Um, so if, I can't see somebody raises a hand. So Marilee, if you can just let me know if anything comes up in the chat. Sure will, absolutely. We'll keep an eye on it. I guess I have to go back to so you you guys looking at the gallery again? I think your screen share stopped on us. Okay. Give me a second, I'll go back to the register. So we're back on that front page, right? We are, yeah, we're seeing December 14, 2020, notice of proposed amendments. All right, so now I'm going to the docket. I'm trying to show you where the uh, where you'd find the material for the, for the proposed changes, because I think that's probably the most useful thing for you to, to go through. No, I'm on this every day. You'd think I'd be able to figure out how to get to things now, right? But it's not that friendly. It's organized like other things. By the time you figure it out, we'll change it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That we're still seeing so, as you browse to comments. All right, so this, this is where you find the comments that people have, have made to date. Um, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. If I if I can provide Marilee with a link to, to find the the um, the proposed changes, they've posted it in for several formats. One was the uh, the marked up version, which I think is the most helpful because you can see the changes they're proposing. And then they've got a clean version, so if if you get confused with all the moving text around that you can see what the proposed version is going to look like. And then there's also figures and tables. Um, but to make comments, the easiest way to make comments is just to go right to the top of the, the, um, the page and hit comment. And then you put in your name and comment and um, you, you're able to download any files if you wanted to attach an official letter. Um, so 
So what I can do is I can bring up a, the marked up version of the document on another file that, that I can share with you um, to show you what it looks like as an example of what you might see. So if you give me a minute, I will um, open up one of those PDFs. So this is going to be marked up part two. I hope that you're looking at that now. Yeah, we're seeing that fine. Okay. So this is the what the proposed part two is going to look like. You can see what they've added it will be an underlying blue. Uh, what's in the existing manual that they're proposing to cross out is crossed out like that. Um, some things that they've moved from another section. Um, so this is, this is one that might be of interest to this group, this new guidance that was added, uh, that signs should not be used on a frequent basis to confirm rules of the road or statutes. Um, I think that includes things like the move over law, bicycle move over law, and, and things of that nature. So that's always been the case, but Federal Highway is adding a new um, guidance statement to at least publish that um, right in the front of the manual. But this is what it would look like when you go through the um, the proposed changes. You'll see where they add new standards um, that are in bold, um, crossed out language, move things from here to there. This is to me the easiest way to find out what the changes are. And, and from most of your perspectives, you're not going to care if it's national if it's consistent with previous national committee material or not. You're just going to be interested in, in what the new edition of the MUTCD means to you. Um, is there any specific areas that anybody would want to look at the changes or is any questions about what the format looks like or how to how, how to uh, review it? I mean, how to review it, I will get you the links that you can find what the proposed um, language is, um, but as far as what you're looking for. Hey, Bill, you had mentioned in one of your emails that there were changes to the portable changeable message boards. Yes. Could you review that for us? Yeah, who was that? I didn't see. Kyle. Kyle. Uh, oh, sorry, Kyle. No worries. Um, whoops. So that's proposed 2L. And th there's other information on the front page of the MUTCD that is um, related to the changeable message boards, too. They, they issued a um, an opinion, I think they call it, but it's if you go to the front page of the MUTCD, it's show, there's a link to it there that'll tell you um, what they're proposing. What, essentially, what the syntax is for using message boards for um, non-traffic control devices like safety messages. All right, so now we're on chapter 2L. All right, so chapter 2L, well, um, one of the things that I take issue with is the premise that this new support language is, and the way that the MUTCD is set up, for those that don't know, uh, the standard is the, the shall condition that, that you should follow all the time or shall follow all the time. Guidance would be essentially the same as the shall condition, but it's, it should, and you can deviate from guidance um, based on engineering study or engineering judgment. Options are things that you might, if you may do, and then support is language that, I guess, provides support for other material in the MUTCD. So the support statement that a CMS is a traffic control device at all times, regardless of the type of message being displayed, I have an issue with, uh, considering I've got a message board at the top of my driveway right now that tells people that we're hiring. Uh, it's on DOT property outside the right-of-way, so as far as I'm concerned, that is not a traffic control device. It, you could argue that it might be subject to local sign ordinance, uh, but it's not a traffic control device. So that's one of the, it's not, it, Federal Highway doesn't see that as a change. They see that as a clarification, uh, but it's one of the things I consider to be a change. 
Uh, no items other than the inventory or maintenance related information shall be displayed on the front or back of a CMS or the or the trailer or the or the exterior housing. Um, things that are probably going to be of interest to to you, Kyle. Um, I don't know if you guys are tied into the Amber Alert system or any of those kind of systems, but there is uh, discussion about what should be a, shouldn't be on an Amber Alert message. So that was one that was changed. Yeah, it's talking about uh, agencies that have um, permanently installed or, or positioned CMS um, shall have a policy. Uh, on how they were going to be used, especially for um, setting the priority of messages. Um, it says that Amber Alerts should not preempt messages related to traffic or travel conditions. I think this is one of the ones that Ashto has got an issue with because uh, when there's an Amber Alert, people are anxiously looking for a person that's missing. Uh, it's hard to argue that uh, road closure, or lane shift ahead takes precedent over that. So I think that states are looking to have some flexibility in that message. It also says that other types of alert messages that aren't AMBER messages um, shall not be displayed on CMS. And I know Asheville has issues with that. Some states are, have things like silver alerts and I think there's a couple other alerts for missing persons um, that traffic engineers aren't the ones that, that put them on the board. They're being told to by governor's offices and, and their safety personnel. Uh, then there's a whole discussion on uh, safety campaign tra transportation and transportation related messages. Uh, they they want to be simple and direct and should emphasize the applicable regulation or warning, and reference any penalties associated. Um, and they're also saying that messages with obscure or secondary meetings, such as with pop culture references or humorous messages or unconventional syntax. Um, should not be used as they may be misunderstood. This is one that a lot of states have been using. A lot of states have been doing contests to come up with some of these safety messages um, that are intentionally meant to be humorous or using pop culture because they, uh, the argument is that people remember them longer. And if you're using it as part of a safety campaign, it, it kind of like the click at a ticket, it's, it's branding your safety campaign. Uh, so that was one of the, I guess, significant changes that they added. And then um, because of COVID, I think Federal Highway has understood that the previous to COVID, they, their impression was that the uh, non, that on any of the non-traffic control device type messages should be re related to transportation. Uh, so that you, they didn't want to promote other public service messages on, on the machines, but with, uh, with Homeland Security, with the COVID stuff going on and other Homeland Security issues, they realized that they've lost that battle uh, that if, if uh, government agencies find that they need to get information to the public and they've got these fixed book messages scattered around that that's the most effective get way to get the message out. Um, so they're, they're trying to say that the Homeland Security and emergency messages shall only be displayed in declared states of emergency. Um, I think that's gonna be a hard one to try to enforce in the, in the years ahead. Now that um, people have become accustomed to putting messages on those boards, um, I think they're going to want to use those for other things. So I don't know, Kyle, are there any specific changes that you're interested in or does that cover kind of what you were asking about? Yeah, I think that covers it. Um, you kind of touched on it, the messages we get asked to post that aren't traffic related uh, by, by our leaders. Um, I yeah. sometimes have, have trouble with. Yeah. And I think that's a case for a lot. And I um, know, the division office in Concord has, has pushed back on us for using the message board for our, our job applicants. But I, I, we feel pretty strongly that if you keep, because contractors have these boards that are in their parking lot and they might do the same thing. Um, or they might put it in the town office parking lot. They might make one available to the town offices if they've got a, a holiday event or something going on. So to me, that, that first support statement that said that Changeable message signs are always traffic control devices. I have an issue with that because I think there are times when they're not traffic control devices. Um, I mean, arguably, if they're used in the right of way, then I think they should be a traffic control device. Um, but it, it, it's a tough 
it's tough to enforce because it's so easy to move these things around and, and to put whatever message you want on them um, that unless people are really in tune with the MUTCD, they might not even be aware to look. They, they know that there's a message board that they have available and there's a message they want to get out and they, they just think that that seems reasonable. That's a good question. I think that's one of the ones that may get a lot of attention in, in the, uh, a lot of the comments in the MPA process. And, and if there's no other questions about it, I, I can move right into that discussion. And I'll stop sharing this screen. Bill, as you move into that discussion, is there a way to highlight the ones that have the most comments? There, there's, is there a way to filter by the most actively discussed proposed amendments or not that we're aware of? Um, that's not the way that they're being posted online. I think you almost have to, I, I know Federal Highway will be doing that, um, but it's part of the rulemaking process. So it happens behind the curtain. So we okay. won't necessarily know that until they respond to the comments. And Marilee, I'm seeing a lot of chat comments. Are those just introductions or? Most of it, it's the links. Bettina and I were adding in the links okay. as you were referring to them. And I did put the, um, I think it's the interpretation letter for the uses of the non-standard syntax on message signs. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll go back to the presentation and I'll kind of run through what I think is the ones, the changes that have the most, um, are the most significant. So if I can get that slide. You're seeing your slide deck, that's fine. Okay. Um, so part one introduction, general information, there's not, a lot of specific traffic control device in there because that's kind of that's more of the general information. So one of the things that they added as a standard uh, was that all documents documentation related to traffic control devices is considered a supplement to the MUTCD. And I think they specifically list things like plans, specifications, policies, uh, and things like that. Uh, and then they go on to say it must be in substantial compliance. And, and that doesn't necessarily, on its face, that doesn't seem to be an issue. Of course, you'd want um, traffic control devices to be in substantial compliance with the MUTCD. It's, it's, the, um, it's the interpretation of what is substantially compl compliant that concerns me. And some of the things, um, and the, the, I guess the expectation that all of the material that we document for traffic control devices would be subject to approval from Federal Highway because uh, we do, you know, we got internal memos, we've got uh, practices, procedures, um, specifications, and, and while we think all of those things are substantial compliance, uh, sometimes it can be subject to interpretation, and, um, and others, especially in Federal Highway, might disagree with us. So uh, it was interesting when, when the Astro Group was reviewing this material, there was probably three or four of us that thought that that new standard was added specifically for us. Um, so it seems like we've a number of us have had similar experience. In New Hampshire, for us, it was um, the definition of a tourist-oriented destination for the, the blue signs that we have, or uh, an attraction for the specific service signs. And um, guys, I know Kyle's on the on the call, so it's it's good to note that when the attractions um, category was at was added to the logo signs in New Hampshire, the first sign that went up within the with an attractions logo was the, the liquor store in Merrimack. And that was because the, um, the Liquor Commission got language into legislation that required the DOT to put up signs advertising locations of liquor stores. And I felt we couldn't do that and be compliant with the MUTCD. So the way I did that was defining them as an attraction. Um, so long story short, Federal Highway didn't necessarily agree with that, but they agreed that it was preferred to having supplemental guide signs for all of the liquor stores that you could get to from the from uh, interstate of a divided highway. Uh, but they also looked into our attractions definitions for other things. And we've got things like prep schools and uh, urban urgent care centers and things that they disagreed with. And, and I guess I wouldn't argue that an urgent care center is not an attraction, uh, but at the same time, uh, they were demanding, um, they were demanding signing on the highways and we didn't want to put the H that we put for hospitals on the highway because they weren't open 24 seven. So we thought uh, to, I guess, appease their interest in having signing, the best way to do that was to 
call it an attraction. So that's one of the issues that I have with that part one. Again, it's it's kind of the general part. It's not related to a specific sign. It's how it's applied to the rest of the manual. Um, the other thing that's got drawing a lot of attention, especially from the, the, the smaller agencies and the local agencies, is the significant changes to what are considered uh, required for experimentation. And again, experimentation would it has a standard that says that any any device that's not compliant with the provisions of the MUTCD is has to be um, considered through a formal experimentation approval to Federal Highway. And on its face, I don't have an issue with that necessarily, or even with the provisions and what's re what's required of experimentation. It's what what is considered non-compliant with the provisions of the MUTCD. And the one I use as a, as an example is that the um, what we call a gateway signs to towns and cities, the welcome to signs. In the MUTCD, those would either be a jurisdictional boundary sign, um, and what we have for welcome signs into, in our towns and cities would not be compliant, or they'd be considered uh, as a subset of the state welcome signs. And most of the signs that you folks have, if you're representing towns, um, that for your gateways would not be compliant. If that's not compliant, then how are you going to experiment on that as a traffic control device? So, again, I, I have comments in the, in the in our version of the comments that those things are not traffic control devices and should be addressed in the manual. Um, but the the part one discussion of experimentation is problematic when you start thinking of how it's applied to other parts of the manual. Some of the key things on signs. One of the big things on signs that's getting a lot of attention, and it's is really the result. It's resulting in the NACTO, Nash, the uh, National Association of City Transportation Officials, asking Federal Highway to rescind um, the, the MUTCD and start all over again, is the speed limit signs. So that's one of their critical areas of concern is that historically the speed limits in the MUTCD um, have referenced the 85th percentile. Um, and for those that don't know the, how speed limits are set, which is an entirely different set presentation Essentially, the law, um, the state statutes determine what the speed limit is for certain characters of road, um, business district, rural residence district, urban residence district, class five roads, which would be all of your town roads, and then everything else other than divided highways is 55 miles an hour. And then this, the Commissioner of Transportation on State Highways and the local governing bodies on local roads are authorized to alter from those statutory speed limits based on an engineering and traffic investigation. And historically, the, 80, the 85th percentile is kind of the basis of the engineering and traffic investigation that the MUTCD currently says that the speed limit should be set within five miles an hour of the 85th percentile. But there's a, a faction of folks um, that are, I guess the safe systems approach is what I've heard the most, um, but it's, people that are promoting lower speed limits and lower speeds. And they, they start with arguing that that needs to coincide with lower speed limits. And some of that interest was prompted by an NTSB report in uh, 2017 um, that recommended that the MUTCD take some of the um, focus of the 85th percentile out of the determination of speed limits. So that's getting a lot of attention uh, with the NTSB report that came out in 2017. I was on a task force in the National Committee to come up with recommended language. Uh, there was a lot of push and take. There's a lot of us as state traffic engineers that have seen uh, where lower speed limits have been lowered speeds that wanted to keep focus on the 85th percentile. But then there's a lot of other folks representing bicyclists, pedestrians, maybe cities that, that wanted to um, provide some flexibility and give people the option to, to lower speed limits to what would be appropriate for a safe operation on a road. Um, and again, that, that's not very well defined. Um, that task force came up with recommendations that the National Committee approved and forwarded to Federal Highway in probably 2018-19 timeframe. And um, the material that's in the NPA largely corresponds to that recommendation. Uh, I don't know if anybody was particularly thrilled with what we came up with in the National Committee, but it was language that we could all live with. And that's essentially what ended up in the NPA. Um, I guess I'd pause and ask, because that was one of the bigger items, if there's any questions on speed limits. I 
not seeing anything in the chat pod, but folks, feel free also to unmute and just jump in if you did have a question. You should be able to control your mute and unmute. Not seeing anyone unmuted either. Okay, we can always come back to that. Um, I think that's one that I know from a state perspective, I get a lot of pressure, lower speed limits, and I'm assuming that any of you in the local perspective get the same, um, same request. Um, I think it's good to have some flexibility and some other criteria, but I've always said that if you're, if you're only changing the number on the sign and you're not changing anything else in the character of the road or the enforcement, that you're not changing the speed. And most of the data that we've had over the years kind of agrees with that. Um, but that's a good segue into the next category is the horizontal alignment warning signs. And the horizontal alignment warning signs that were in the uh, 2009 manual had a compliance state. That was a, a new table 2C5 that was in 2009 that had a compliance date of, I think, 2019. It was 10 years. Um, new Hampshire is one of the handful of states that have met that compliance or will be meeting it this summer. Um, but then there was subsequent Texas Transportation Institute research that came up with a new table, 2C5, that's in the current MPA that somewhat changes what, we, what we've done. Uh, so that the horizontal alignment warning signing is different in the MPA, uh, but it's based on fairly robust research that was done in Texas, uh, well, done in different parts of the country, but by Texas A&M. Changeable message signs we've talked about already. Uh, Jurisdictional boundary signs I talked about as well. Um, that's one that I think is Federal Highway, I think, has an impression that um, if they see things that are what they consider to be poor practice, that they need to address that in the MBTCD so that people won't do it. And they don't understand that some of those things like the, the gateway signs that may not be traffic control devices and they, while it might kind of make the hair on a traffic engineer's neck rise, the public doesn't really see that as being an issue. And those are the things that I think are somewhat problematic as the, um, the MBTC keeps getting to be more and more restrictive. Um, so moving on to markings, a big one for markings that I think would be of interest, might be of interest to you folks, would be the requirement for six inch width lines for speed limits greater than 40 miles an hour. Uh, from, from our perspective on the state, and this is, this is something for the um, autonomous vehicles. So the machine vision of autonomous vehicles has been shown to uh, pick up the six inch lines much better than the four inch lines because they, they last long, they don't last longer, but there's more of the material left than there would be a four, a four inch line. So they, they are able to pick up the six inch lines better for a longer period of time. So that's been something that national committee has been aware of for a while. And, and they work through their markings technical committee would make recommendations for six inch lines for 50 miles or greater than 50 miles an hour. So it was gonna be 55 and up, which wouldn't have been much of a burden for us because for, for my perspective, that's even though that's the statutory maximum speed limit for a two lane road, um, we could probably manage a 55 mile uh, an hour speed limit for six inch lines by putting you know, the Laconia bypass or the Hillsborough bypass and then all the divided highways. But when you drop it to greater than 40, now you're talking about 45 and 50 mile an hour speed limits. And we're not gonna, if you're striping a stretch of road that goes from 50 to 35 to 30 to 40 to 45, we're not gonna go back and forth uh, because we don't do that live. We'd have to do it in separate trips. If, uh, if it goes to greater than 40, we would essentially have to change the markings for all of our roads to, to six inch, which is a fairly significant cost. And it's not just the cost of the product, uh, if you're if you're painting 50% um, more in the width of a line, you're not going to be able to go as far in a day. Uh, so we're not going to be able to get as much length done in a day as we would with a four inch line, unless we were able to bring more material and, and um, re uh, reload the truck on the on the road, which we've gotten away from because of the the risk of of dumping and having a spill. And to go along with that, and again from machine vision, this is a uh, requirement for chevrons and gore areas. Uh, so rather than the, the diverging white lines that we have as for an exit, and I think you could say the same thing for right turn slip lanes and things like that, that there, there would be um, chevrons within that gore area to reinforce the fact that the lane split. And again, that's from machine vision. And um, while it can be shown to improve safety for sighted drivers or human drivers, it, it's primarily for machine vision. 
And I can tell you that from the um, National Committee perspective, the markings folks have been way ahead of all of the other parts of the manual when considering CAV issues, because I think those are the primary guidance information for the, the uh, uh, auto, automated vehicles. Uh, so moving on, the, the, when we talk about the speed limit discussion, and, and I added this slide from something that I've done previously, a big issue with the speed limit um, signing is that it's a speed culture. Um, so I, I get the impression that for the most part, even though the law says that the speed limit is a sign on the left, uh, is on the on the right that you have to go less than or equal to what's on the sign. People treat it as the sign on the left, where they have to go at least what's on the speed limit sign. And changing the value of the speed limit sign doesn't change that culture. I think the culture is that people drive what they feel comfortable on on a road, and the speed limit um, being arbitrarily set lower than that isn't changing that culture. Um, so I've been working. It's again, it's separate to this discussion, but I've been working with the state police uh, motor vehicles and the chiefs of police association to try to address some of the, the culture of speeding and, and find effective ways to, to try to address that. To me, the, the speed limit is the last means to do that. So moving on and the changes to the MUTCD, uh, the signals chapter includes new material that incorporates previously approved interim approvals. So you, you now see in the MUTCD the material on uh, RRFBs or rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Um, I know DOT, uh, my staff has been working with a lot of communities through the um, resurfacing program to identify cat, uh, uh, locations for RRFBs, uh, for new crosswalks and for retrofitting any existing crosswalk locations. So that material is worthwhile. And there's also, I don't know if anybody's interested in bike signals, I think some communities that have a really strong bike, bike presence with a lot of bike lanes uh, have been added bike signals. Um, I don't. I know we don't have any on the state system, uh, but I'm not sure if any of you on the local system would be looking at it. Autonomous vehicles is a new part of the MUTCD, a, a proposed new part. A uh, part five used to be for low volume local roads. Uh, Federal Highway added um, a, part, a new part, all new material for autonomous vehicles. And again, this is one of the areas of concern for the folks that are asking for the NPA to be rescinded. Uh, there's folks that think that um, they've been waiting for a specific part for pedestrians in the MUTCD for a long time, and that they're upset that autonomous vehicles kind of jumped ahead of them and got their new part, and there's still um, pedestrian issues are incorporated to the rest of the manual. Um, part six, temporary traffic control. Again, I, there's, there's new typical applications that you might be interested in, but one of the things that I think is significant is that there's um, a requirement for accessible pedestrian signal control for rerouted sidewalks. So if you're gonna take a sidewalk and close it for any construction work and re reroute that path, um, they're looking for audible, um, and I'd have to look into part six to see exactly what they're requiring, but they wanna be able to tell somebody that's visually impaired that they have to uh, change direction uh, because they're not gonna have the same uh, cues that they would have in the pre-construction environment. I didn't, I'm not aware of anything significant in the schools or rail light rail transit. I think rail light rail transit might be significant where there's discussion about a diagnostic team being involved with any, any changes to rail, uh, highway rail crossings. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with the rail crossings in the state. Um, that's a second, a separate section for us. We we essentially are responsible for the uh, uh, railroad crossing uh, stencil markings and some of the sign advanced signing, but everything else is is for the railroad owner. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience with that. And then the last item in the MUTCD, uh, it's a part nine, is bicycles. Uh, there's a lot of new material in bicycles, and there's certainly been a lot of advocacy in the the, the national committee for bike concerns. Uh, there's things like the multicolored lanes, bikeways, um, separate bikeways, um, things that I don't see us having a lot of applications for in New Hampshire, um, but they might be something that, the, the reason I don't see those applications necessarily in New Hampshire is the things that are being proposed as changes are a significant maintenance burden. Uh, there's be a lot of markings uh, and physical infrastructure that would have to be maintained uh, on a pretty regular basis because I think that those kinds of things get beat up um, in winter maintenance and other activities. 
And I think that was pretty much it uh, that I had for material. And I'd be happy to take any questions uh, from Betty, anybody in the, uh, on the call. Uh, Bill, it's Bettina. Uh, we had one question in the chat pod from Wayne. And um, the question is if there's any new guidance or requirements for locations where crosswalks are or are not appropriate locations, particularly at prospective mid-block locations. Um, good question, Wayne. Uh, and I don't think you're going to see that in the METCD. Uh, there is some new material in there, but I think it leaves a lot of fle flexibility. I think that's more in the guidelines that my agency, uh, my staff have been developing. Um, we've been working with Federal Highway on a parallel process on the uh, its STEP program. So it's safe transportation for every pedestrian. And, and we've been working um, on guidelines for where we would uh, require RRFB for any new crosswalk, uh, including and when we say RRFB, we're, we're looking at, for those that don't know, it's it's the pedestrian actuated warning system. So that'd be the, the typical pedestrian warning sign uh, with rectangular beacons underneath that when a pedestrian's about to cross, they push a button and those lights flash to grab the motorist's attention. Uh, it doesn't change the regulation. It essentially reminds the motorists that there's a pedestrian about to cross and that they should, they're supposed to stop for them. So our guidelines are determining where we would require those for any new locations, um, but we're also having guidance in there that would recommend those for existing locations that don't have them for the same reasoning. Um, the RFBs have been shown to improve motorist compliance from something in the single digit, digits to something closer to 70 to 75. So they've been shown to be very effective in getting motorists to um, to yield to pedestrians and crosswalks. Um, one of the challenges that we have with that is existing crosswalk locations or mid-block crosswalk locations that people have become accustomed to, they may meet the guidelines for um, our, where we would require an RFB for a new crossing, um, but they, it could be $50,000 for an agency uh, when you add in all the engineering uh, and construction and, and all of that time they could be pretty expensive devices. So it's hard for us to go out and tell the town that well, while you've never had an issue at this particular crosswalk, we're gonna make you put $50,000 worth of infrastructure in. So our guidelines are, are developed to, so we can pretty much require them uh, where we think they, they'd be warranted based on traffic volumes or number of lanes uh, and some other criteria, maybe even speed limits. Uh, but. We, we're using that, those same guidelines to recommend them in other locations as well. And I don't see Wayne on the screen, but did that answer your question, Wayne? Wayne is saying yes. Thank okay. you, Bill. Okay. Um, I see Christina Hall says Lebanon and Corp incorporates bikes wherever possible. And, and I do recognize that. And I think Lebanon and Hanover areas have done quite a bit of work with the bikes, uh, bike communities and bike infrastructure. Um, but I think even what you folks are doing, which I think is, is quite a bit, um, pales in co into comparison with, in comparison to what's being offered as options in the MUTCD. Um, so there is a lot of material in there. And if, if folks are willing to make that investment and, and to maintain it, I think it's, there's some good strategies, um, but a lot of that stuff that's in there too requires some right-of-way space. Um, and I know you can do the lane diets where you go from a four or five lane section to something like three uh, and incorporate some bike, bike pedestrian amenities, um, but that doesn't work in all cases either. I, I guess, Bettina, are you scrolling through the questions? Not seeing anything else in there right now. And again, if anyone wants to, Brian, I, I noticed, Brian, you, you're you unmuted. I don't know if you have a question. Feel free to jump in. That might just be that you bumped that. <laughs> you have to put him on the spot. <laughs> I'm not seeing anyone else unmuted or any other questions in the chat pod. Um, I, I guess I... I would put this as a question to the group because speed limits, I think, is one of the significant changes. Uh, if people are 
responsible for speed limits in their towns, um, if they, um, what the process would be for determining is one of the comments I've made to the, the MUTCD um, docket is that um, they, they have a focus on um, applications of the MUTCD shall be uh, conducted by people that are experienced and versed or um, essentially they're saying that professional traffic engineers should be making decisions related to traffic control devices. And from my perspective, dealing with communities for, for 20 years is a regulatory decisions are not made by the folks that are putting the signs up. Those are, those are decisions that are made by the local governing body. Uh, and then the person that's putting the sign up is just doing what they're told. Um, might have some input, but I, I'd be curious to know if that's the case, because that's a comment that I've been making fairly consistently is that Federal Highway assumes that uh, state traffic engineers are making all these decisions. And a lot of times in the local communities, it's not certainly the state traffic engineer, it's, it's a public works director at best, who's also responsible for all the rest of the, um, I guess, public works activities. You know, with Gretchen, and I just share, you know, you and I have talked about this a number of times in previous life, even when I was back when I was a police chief, about the whole speed limit situation. And, um, you know, certainly I get clued in and pass that along to our um, local select board and let them know that you just can't go and arbitrarily make these changes uh, just because you think that the speed limit should be reduced. Um, in those areas, um, as you know, sometimes um, as public works directors or even as police chiefs, we get trumped in those situations and are told to put up a sign. Uh, but then it becomes an issue of the enforceability of it because it does come all the way back. It would be nice, though, Bill. I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of the communities now have the ability to do the... Um, the surveys that are conducted relative to establishing what that 85 percentile um, could be uh, certainly derived from. And I know in, when I was in Bolenboro, I did have the equipment in order to do that, started out with the tubes and then went to the other um, you know, devices to go ahead and track the speed of vehicles and directions and sizes and those types of things. And we're able to establish those 85 percentiles. Of course, our select boards we're not happy about when they saw some of those results uh, because the roads, in fact, were designed in order to, to uh, they were accepting those speeds that were considerably higher, although they were looking to get the um, speeds down. And it is, a, it, once again, I think, as you've alluded to, there is an educational curve in trying to figure out what other types of methods there are other than putting up speed limit signs, which are lower, um, and coming up with traffic calming uh, type um, devices or <clears throat> abilities to do that, uh, whether it be with, you know, uh, striping, um, you know, lines, uh, lane sizes and those types of things there, um, that way. Is there, is there ability within the MUTCD that it doesn't have to be a, um, a traffic engineer to make that, um, that study and survey relative to the 85 percentile? Or is it still right now have to be a, um, a traffic engineer in order to establish that? That's a good question, Scott. And that's kind of a combination of what's in state statutes and what's in the MUTCD. Uh, the MUTCD would suggest that an engineering study should be conducted. Um, and then the state statute would require that uh, local jurisdiction or state jurisdiction to create a, to alter a speed limit or create a state speed zone based on an engineering and traffic investigation, but neither of those documents does it define what an engineering study should be. Um, so that, that's subject to, to interpretation. Um, I think the state statutes say that a, a town doesn't have to hire a consultant if they have um, staff uh, resources that can do, conduct a study. And again, it doesn't say what the qualifications of that staff member should be. Uh, so that's open for interpretation as well. But I, I think the, um, the methodology for doing the engineering and traffic investigation is a lot simpler now. Um, one of the things that we don't use just the 85th, percent, 85th percentile, we also use a program that Federal Highway develops called US Limits 2. Uh, if you Google US Limits 2, all one word, and it's uh, two is a number two, 
Uh, it'll take you to their website. It's pretty intuitive. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, it includes input variables for um, a lot of the type, the, the characteristics of the road, the traffic volume, measured speed, 85th percentile and 50th percentile and crash history. And it comes up with through an algorithm with a recommended speed limit. So I, I think the answer to your question, Scott, is that um, there does need to be some engineering study. It's not very well defined, so it's pretty open for interpretation. Um, but the engineering study is not as cumbersome as it once was. Yeah, that, 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 that certainly sounds like it is a great resource to be able to have that type of information that you can either utilize your safety committees, which are, you know, generally made up of public works, uh, police, fire, um, maybe somebody from uh, town administration side of things there that could, you know, look at all this information and data based on the, the resource that you just provided that probably could have something that could hopefully stand up uh, because it ends up becoming a an issue of living, you know, and you end up getting into a court situation where you have a police officer write somebody a, a speeding ticket, and um, that will be, you know, I've seen them be challenged before based upon uh, municipal speed limits. I mean, the state does a, does a great job in making a lot of those established, you know, speed limits on their roadways, and they're dictated by statute and or um, the other characteristics in which you, you mentioned. Uh, but you know, municipal roads, I think, are a little bit more of a challenge for folks uh, that way. Yeah, and one thing that's important to note, and again, speed limits are probably a different discussion and could be a whole separate presentation, but one thing that we found when we did our horizontal alignment signing is that the horizontal alignment signing in the current Table 2C5, and I think to some degree in the proposed um, NPA, is based on the, the difference between the posted speed limit and the measured advisory speed. So the measured advisory speed would be, um, we use a, a device that'll measure deflection as a vehicle goes around a curve at, at various speed. Uh, and based on that deflection, you determine what the advisory speed is. So if your measured advisory speed is less than the posted speed limit, that determines that you need some horizontal alignment or curve warning signs. But if your speed limit doesn't capture the majority of people on the road, if it's arbitrarily set at a number that's maybe the 5, 10, 15th percentile, the advisor speed is likely to be higher than the posted speed limit, but it's still going to be less than a lot of the people on the road are driving. So what we found out when we were doing these curve signing projects is that curves that had kind of a crash history of had, had we had put some curve warning signs up for, we were really taking them down uh, because the speed limit, one of the first things that we had done generations ago, if people were going off the outside of a curve, is we lower the speed limit through that section. Well, now, now we're finding that people aren't going any slower um, um, when they get to those curves um, so that that advisory speed information, the horizontal alignment signing is not available to them. And the other thing that we found with the speed limits is if it's arbitrarily low and we're looking at passing zones, the passing site distance for a low speed limit is a lot less than it would be for a high, higher speed limit. So if you're if your passing site distance or your passing zones are based on a speed limit that doesn't capture most of the people on the road, then the people that are driving on that road may not have the passing site distance they need for the actual speed they're driving. So speed limits to me are important to be um, based on a, I guess a reasonable and prudent value for the maximum speed that somebody should go on a road because there's so many other things that, that are based on that value. Great. Um, we also have a comment on speed limits from Wayne. He's saying we try very hard to stick with the 85th percentile speed. Randomly lowering speed limits uh, is not a real good idea, but the pressure is always there. Yeah, and in, in the Northeast, Wayne, you're not too far from Boston, and a lot of the, the studies that are being promoted are uh, the, the speed study or the speed limit reduction that Boston did. I think the citywide speed limit might be 20, if not 25, and a lot of people are hanging their hat on research that was done to show how effective that was, and if you look hard at the, uh, the uh, details of the study, um, they didn't necessarily get any lower speeds when they lowered the speed limit. Um, but they had a control city, which I think was Providence, and Providence's speed went up a mile an hour um, when Boston stayed the same. So a lot of people are promoting that speed limit reduction in Boston as being a good example of why um, speed limits 
should be set at a lower value, especially in urban areas. So, and I think um, your condition in Nashua is probably more consistent with what NACTO has been trying to promote is lower speed limits in urban settings to promote a safer environment for bikes and peds. And I'm not arguing that it's good to have a safer environment, that it's not good to have a safer environment for bikes and peds. I'm just, I'm concerned that people get comfortable with just lowering the speed limit and they stop doing anything else to change the character of the road to, to drive speeds down. We also, thank you, Bill. We also have one more question from Christina in Lebanon. Um, with the mid-block crossing, what is the maximum allowable speed limit or recommended speed limit? Thanks, Christina. That's a, uh, that's a good question. Um, our guidelines aren't finalized yet. Um, historically, New Hampshire would have allow, wouldn't allow a mid-block crosswalk for speed limits greater than 35 miles an hour. Uh, with the RRFB, we're, we're looking at um, bumping that up to 40. Uh, we would probably be, probably be willing to consider in certain circumstances something higher than that. Um, but if you go higher than that, we'd probably be looking at more of a pedestrian hybrid beacon where it's a it's a red signal where people are obligated to stop we don't have a lot of them up in the state as as examples um, but folks might be familiar with the two that are in meredith um, and there's there's one in epping two in gosstown um, i can't think of any more off the top of my Dairy head have some here. now i believe where was that i think in Derry, i believe they've put some up recently the pedestrian hybrid beacons? The RRFBs, I'm sorry. Yeah, RF, yeah Derry does have RRFBs. They're, they're scattered around quite a bit. It's the pedestrian hybrid beacon, which is, yep. uh, it's dark. It's three signal heads. It'd be two red on the top, and then there's a flashing, um, two red on the top, and then a flashing yellow underneath that. So it's dark unless somebody pushes the button, and then the, the flashing yellow goes to solid, uh, to flash, the, the yellow light turns on flashing to let people know that there's gonna be a change and then it goes to the solid, like a traffic signal would, and then it goes to a solid red. That means everybody has to stop. And then it it then goes to a flashing don't want, uh, a flashing red. That means that if the pedestrians cross your path, you can proceed. So that's more than an RFB and that's where we might consider uh, higher speed limits where we had that kind of a device. And Christina, did that answer that question? She says, yes, thank you. Okay, good. So I'm not seeing any other questions. This has been really very helpful. Thank you so much, Bill. I don't know if there are any other um, points or um, thoughts you had that you wanted to share, but certainly we welcome you to come back anytime, not to put you on the spot, but this has been fantastic. And I don't know if um, speed limits and, and how they're set is a topic of interest for the audience, but certainly you know, anyone on the call, we don't have a an official post workshop evaluation for this one today, but if there are follow up thoughts and you know, things that would be helpful for us to keep working on. Um, we'd love to you know, connect with Bill or others and, and see what we can continue to bring into these types of platforms for discussion. Um, but Bill, thank you very much. I appreciate all, all you've provided any um, follow up questions or any thoughts from, from you, Bill, as we, we wrap up. The only thing that I would add as a parting uh, comment is, first of all, I'd like to get you the the um, links to the material um, that shows what the proposed changes are. I apologize for not finding that today. Um, but then I also encourage any of the municipalities or anybody that is involved with traffic control devices that has an interest in the MVTCD. Uh, if you've got specific thing, things that might concern you, good or bad, um, certainly submit those as comments. Because one of the things uh, that he Federal Highway has to do is they have to respond to, or they have, have to address all the comments submitted as part of the docket. And if all the comments, if people assume that the things that they're proposed to change are good and that everybody's gonna like them, uh, that's not always the case. And sometimes those things that we take for granted as being positive, uh, get some negative comments. And if Federal Highway doesn't have any positive to support the changes, um, then they might have to um, take those changes away. So certainly I'd encourage anybody that has an interest uh, to, to um, submit their comments for or against material in the MUTCD NPA. Excellent. Thank you very much. And this will be recorded. So what I will do is um, send a follow-up email to everyone who 
attended today with a link to the recording, if helpful to share or revisit it. Um, we'll include those links. And so when, when I receive those, I'll put those into the email as well. And then if anyone has follow-up thoughts, questions, um, I think we've shared those information, but if not, are you comfortable with us including that as well? I know we see you on pw.net popping in once in a while, but if folks don't have your information, I'll, I'll share that as well. Um, Absolutely. And then just let us know if we can help with anything at T2. Uh, we've got the technical assistance available. We're happy to um, pull together some um, more direct support, um, put you in touch with RPCs as that's helpful or um, resources or information. We did a full series on safer roads last year and those are uh, recorded and available on, on YouTube, including, including on step, um, reducing roadway departures. We talked a bit about curve signage and speeds um, through those sessions. Um, so certainly please keep in touch with whatever we can do to help you all. Hopefully we'll see a couple of you at our, our social media sessions coming up. Uh, lots going on in the calendar. Check it out. Um, Bill, thank you again for joining us for all the great information. And thank you all for being here with us today. Stay safe, stay well, and everybody have a great day. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Bill.